This is William O'Connell, and we're talking once again about the Kennedy assassination and the Warren Commission report. And our guest today is Josiah Thompson. Dr. Thompson is a professor of philosophy at Haverford College. He's been a student at Oxford University and the universities of Copenhagen and Yale. He's done a two-year hitch in the Marine, uh, I beg your pardon, <laughs> in the Navy um, in 1958, that is when the uh, Marines landed in Lebanon. He was a uh, an officer in the Navy. He commanded the UDT detachment charged with beach reconnaissance. He has a new scholarly workout entitled The Lonely Labyrinth, Kierkegaard's pseudonymous works, and uh, which was published uh, in the same month. Uh, as Six Seconds in Dallas, which is the book we'll be discussing this evening. So I should say welcome to KPFK, Dr. Thompson. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, apropos of Kierkegaard, the only uh, remembrance I had of him, in as much as my reading in philosophy was primarily directed at uh, uh, Thomism, uh, the works of Berdyaev, and some of the commentaries of Meritain, I do remember one uh, statement of Kierkegaard's that seems appropriate at this time, and I think it went something like this, I have not let go of my thoughts, I have not made my life comfortable. And that leads me to the question, uh, why have the, uh, isn't it true that it's, it's uh, apropos of the researchers on the Kennedy assassination, they, they refuse to let go of their thoughts, they refuse to lead a comfortable life, it's the, the happy passion uh, of the philosopher and the activist at the same time. What is it that that uh, that creates this, and how is it sustained? I, I think that's a superb point, um, because the uh, the parallel between the Kierkegaardian obsession, uh, Kierkegaard's obsession with ideas and with subjective truth, and the kind of obsession, and I think that's the correct word, uh, for the projects and activities of the Kennedy researchers, uh, I, th I think it's very clever, to uh, very acute, uh, to begin with that parallel. Because I think by pointing out the obsessive uh, quality and character of the uh, psyche that engages in these researches, uh, you point out, on, on the one hand, uh, the uh, lack of comfort that goes with that sort of obsession, the willingness to take hazard and danger, but on the other hand, uh, also the hazards and dangers that go with that. Uh, because the danger of an obsession is, of course, that it becomes unmeasured, uh, becomes uh, unstructured and undisciplined uh, by the canons of reason. And I think this, uh, this tension uh, between one's commitment to this task, uh, to the solution of this almost religious mystery, at least it seems to have a religious flavor in the consciousness of, of, of many people who have investigated it. The contrast between that obsession and the necessity, while one is pursuing the solution of that mystery, to, to make one's project still measured and disciplined. Yes. I think that's the, 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 uh, the very center of the whole problem of any person who interests himself and engages in this kind of work. Uh, I felt it myself quite quite keenly on, on many occasions. I concluded a, a two-hour summary in November of 1967 on the Kennedy assassination, and I did point out at that time that many of the researchers, at the expense of uh, uh, vindictive uh, uh, personal insults, uh, had, by this very uh, obsession of theirs, uh, enabled us uh, to advance the dialogue on the Warren Commission report and the assassination to a point where now, thanks to their work and uh, to yours as well, of course, uh, we, we've gained uh, greater insights uh, and uh, greater knowledge of the case than we had, say, two or three years ago. But there has been a prevalent uh, criticism, and it was voiced uh, last year by Professor Bickle, uh, whom I notice uh, has given a rather encouraging review to your new book, Six Seconds in Dallas, in a recent issue of The New Republic. But Professor Bickle of Yale had this stricture uh, that he placed on the heads of the critics. He said 
that uh, much of their research seemed to stem from a kind of new left revisionism. And uh, when M.S. Arnone uh, of the Minority of One was in Los Angeles, <coughs> I raised this question, and his reply was that uh, indeed this was instead a, a, an ad hominem argument that Professor Bickle was advancing and that it did not have substance. It, yet it has been repeated, especially now with uh, the publicity uh, surrounding the Garrison probe. How would you reply, Dr. Thompson, to that uh, kind of stricture? And I think the uh, I think the stricture is warranted. I think the stricture is warranted in in many cases. It seems to me that the only way to reply to it is to point out that the ideal of the uh, totally objective researcher is a totally irrelevant ideal to any existing human being. That any researcher who engages in a project which demands the uh, sustained energy. Uh, that this sort of project demands um, must uh, be personally involved on the most primitive and basic level. So the fact that uh, uh, many of the critics of the Warren Report stand on the left rather than on the right, uh, it, it seems to me this is a fact. But again, it doesn't seem to me that this fact should reflect in any way on the... Uh, conclusions that are drawn out of these researchers and uh, out of these researches uh, the problem is of course as one engages in this kind of research to draw the line between what one would wish to be the case and what one sees very coolly and incisively is the case uh, and even more importantly to not let one's wishes uh, pull one's conclusions farther than the evidence warrants and it seems to me that that problem has haunted almost all of the researches into the Kennedy assassination up to now, the problem of the unlimited. Would you expound on that? I I could you give us a few examples, perhaps? Well, I, I heard on the, on the radio uh, coming over this evening that uh, Jim Garrison, as part of his uh, uh, latest announcement of the subpoenas on three material witnesses, uh, announced that the assassination was in fact uh, a coup d'etat, uh, a shift in power in this country, and that this is the proper uh, uh, ground for understanding it. Well, it seems to me this is an interesting theory, which may in fact uh, turn out to be the case. Uh, but at the present time, I know of precious little evidence for it. And that uh, unwillingness to distinguish between what sort of statements one can justify uh, when one is questioned about them. I mean, what, what possibly could uh, Jim Garrison reply if a very steely-eyed and cool investigative reporter said, now, Mr. Garrison, that's interesting uh, rhetoric. Let's have a few facts. You say this is a coup d'etat. All right, a coup d'etat by whom? Uh, what plans were put in operation? How do you know of the existence of these plans? Etc. 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 And one could one could duplicate this uh, sort of uh, unlimited uh, th theorizing uh, uh, again and again and again. I think I, I think simply the critics have been guilty of uh, of theorizing uh, without due regard to the limits of the evidence they were dealing with, and in many cases this has served only to embarrass their efforts and the efforts of their colleagues. Apropos of, of your efforts in Six Seconds in Dallas, there are a number of uh, new uh, points that you make in the book. Uh, I alluded to uh, not the book but the article extracted from the book that had appeared in a uh, issue of the Saturday Evening Post in November, and uh, only since then have I had an opportunity to read the book itself, which I found very impressive, and I wonder if I could then address myself and uh, we could address ourselves to some of the points you raise in the book uh, there was a no there was a terribly interesting um, discussion uh, surrounding a Polaroid photograph taken by a bystander at the assassination by the name of Mary Mormon now this had been treated before I believe on one of my broadcasts by Raymond Marcus who concluded that there were certain human images uh, in the background of this photos 
uh, that uh, might be. He did not uh, say that they were assassins, but he said that they could be perhaps potential assassins or that their existence should have been uh, given cognizance by the the commission and uh, that this should have been explored and that we should have made an attempt to uh, discover their identity. But in your book, I find a, a completely new uh, human image or or the suggestion of a human image is, uh, perhaps is, is the better term, uh, behind the stockade fence where many people felt that uh, a shot or shots uh, were fired. Uh, what? How should one weigh your a suggestion of a human image as opposed to Mr. Marcus's image? Well, I think one should uh, weigh the two claims with reference to the uh, primitiveness of the evidence displayed. I believe, for example, that the number five man, which appears near the pergola in a Bende negative uh, developed here by uh, David Lifton, and uh, I believe this is part of Mr. Marcus's uh, theory, too, um, uh, after I made an effort and succeeded in getting uh, a, a copy made from Mary Mormon's original Polaroid uh, print in Dallas, succeeded this, uh, this winter in getting this copy, it turns out that that man seems to, or that figure, apparent figure, seems to recede into the distance, uh, seems to, pardon me, seems to even disappear in the photograph. As one gets to two more primitive levels of, of evidence, in other words, away from a Bende screen negative down finally to the original photographic surface, uh, which ultimately must produce or not produce any images whatsoever, uh, it seems to me that most of these images seem to decay and even disappear. But that's uh, perhaps not the most important uh, uh, element here in evaluating um, uh, what's in this photograph. Uh, we do have some testimony from other witnesses who were in this general area as to what people were there. And in addition, we have other photographs. Marilyn Sitzman, for example, who was standing on the pedestal with Abraham Zapruder, told me that uh, sitting on a um, park bench behind this small concrete wall were a young uh, Negro couple in their late teens. Uh, however, she saw uh, no one else, and that uh, this Negro couple seemed to be simply innocently sitting there, and uh, after the assassination, as many people uh, did uh, in a frightened state, uh, ran away. Now, uh, I am interested in this one uh, particular anomalous form. I don't claim that it's a recognizable human figure, all I claim is that it's an anomalous form along the fence line, about 15 feet uh, down from the corner. Now, why I'm interested in this particular form is that its location fits in with a, a, a net of other evidence, which leads to exactly that same position. Uh, the testimony of at least seven witnesses seeing a puff of smoke in that area, the testimony uh, preeminently of S.M. Holland and uh, uh, witnesses Dodd and Simmons, who found um, curious circles of footprints, cigarette butts, and mud on a bumper immediately behind the fence at that point, again points to that uh, general location. Uh, I attempted to determine whether this uh, shape could be a function of the site, and uh, by taking control shots from the same position as Mrs. Mormon occupied, determined that it could not be. Of course, the most interesting and the perhaps the most critical piece of evidence here is actually the movement of the president's head under impact. And that movement, uh, shocking, violent movement backwards and to the left, uh, would accord with a shot uh, fired from the general position of this uh, anomalous shape along the fence. Well, uh, the thing that was interesting to me in a recent issue of the Los Angeles Free Press, in which uh, Mr. Marcus uh, put forward his uh, his theories on this uh, photograph, uh, he admitted uh, that that the photograph in question of the number five man, or the primary image uh, that he uh, gives a candidacy for as a as possibly a potential assassin. Uh, that this man could not have been firing a f the fatal shot or the shot that impacted on the president's head at uh, 312 or 313 uh, because he projected both f before the photograph and after the photograph what the uh, 
uh, particular movement and body stance of the person uh, in question would be, this particular image. It seems to me that that's also applicable to your image. We see a hat or perhaps a head peering over a wall, uh, but we don't see any, any gun, we don't see any rifle, at least um, aren't we really uh, in the realm of, of speculation and, and uh, second guessing here, or is that too harsh? Uh, yes, I don't see a, I mean, if clearly one could see a face and a hat and no gun, then quite obviously the uh, the figure there w would not have been firing a weapon. However, um, uh, I don't claim to see, even in the original photograph, under magnification, a human head or a face or a, or a hat or really much of anything. I see an anomalous uh, shape, and uh, uh, that shape could be a human face and a hat and a gun or two of the three or one of the three. Uh, I, I think simply on that point, we don't have enough evidence to, to move to a conclusion on, on either side. Speaking of the uh, movement of the president's head, uh, in the, as seen in the, uh, I believe it's the Zapruder film, uh, you also uh, indicate uh, by your reproduction of, of frames of a motion picture film taken by a man by the name of Nix, I believe, the clear uh, movement of the president's head uh, by the calculations that you have made by the, the sketches and, and diagrammatic uh, aids that you use in the book, and I think it's, it's very convincing. But it always seems to me to lead us back to the question of the autopsy, and you, you deal yeah. rather importantly with this. Uh, the conclusion of the autopsy surgeons at Bethesda Naval Hospital was uh, that the president uh, suffered a, a shot from above and behind uh, and that that shot was the shot that caused the fatal injury and the, the shot that killed the president. Uh, I know many people uh, have, have argued about the motion of the head, but it seems to me you advance the dialogue by uh, addressing or confronting uh, what the autopsy says and uh, you you critique the autopsy with the with the film in mind, and uh, yet you attempt to give a reconstruction that is not uh, at odds or does not uh, uh, laugh off the autopsy conclusions or or what have you. And I wonder if you could, in in a way, recreate for us uh, the conclusions you came to in in, in the step by step reconstruction uh, of the film and and the autopsy findings and how you attempted to. Uh, mesh them. Uh, yes, I think the first thing to say about medical evidence with respect to the president's head injury is that one has an overlay of uh, corroboration uh, between the Parkland doctors and between uh, the Bethesda autopsy report, but one also has a considerable area of conflict in that data. Uh, the description of the president's head wound, the best description we have, as given by Dr. McClellan, would indicate that the occipital and parietal bones were exploded outward, out the back of the president's head. Uh, this uh, description by Dr. McClellan simply is not consistent uh, with the uh, uh, description of the location of this small entry hole in the occipit, in the bone at the extreme rearmost uh, point of the president's head. So um, what I've tried to do is to give <laughs> both uh, doctors uh, uh, McClellan and his colleagues at Parkland Hospital and also the doctors at Bethesda um, a fair break and believe that where we have uh, disagreements or conflicts it's due to disagreements of detail or location and by weaving these two descriptions of the damage done to the president's head together it's possible to detect two rather subtle patterns. Uh, one pattern indicating the more moderate damage uh, done by a bullet uh, striking the president in the back of the head, uh, driving forwards, uh, causing a, a back-to-front parasagal lacer laceration uh, that is parallel to the midsection of the brain, uh, uh, causing certain damage over the left temporal, uh, over the left temple, certain damage behind the nose and in the globe of the right eye, depositing uh, uh, fragments in the right frontal sinus, uh, damage of this sort. In addition, 
then by turning basically now to the reports of the Parkland surgeons, the reports of Dr. McClellan, of uh, Dr. Jenkins, of Dr. Kemp Clark, uh, one gets uh, the impression of the much more destructive effect of a bullet impacting on the right uh, temporal parietal region and exploding backwards uh, over the back of the car. It seems to me actually one of the most significant facts with respect to uh, reconstructing this double impact on the president's head or whatever impact occurred on the president's head is um, one small piece of bone that was discovered by a bystander uh, the day after the assassination some 25 feet to the south or left of the vehicle's direction of travel. Now that piece of bone was taken to the pathologist at Methodist Hospital in Dallas and it was identified as having come from the occipital region of the skull. Uh, this seems to me to be rather critical uh, because for a fragment of bone coming from the occiput, this bone which is located dead center in the back of the head, for a fragment to be blown 25 feet to the left simply does not seem in any way consistent with the impact of a bullet fired from directly behind uh, on, on, on virtually a straight trajectory, only six degrees, uh, blowing forward and thus blowing out the right top of the president's head. But this area of medical evidence is a very hazardous, hazardous area in the extreme, mainly due to the vagueness of the autopsy report itself. As Dr. Weck, Dr. Cyril Weck, director of the Institute of Forensic Sciences, who wrote an appendix for this book, Six Seconds in Dallas, as Dr. Weck pointed out, um, the brain examination was uh, woefully incomplete. As far as Dr. Weck can find, no examination was made of the left cerebral hemisphere. No coronal sections were taken, which is certainly a rather unusual procedure. And this rather vagueness with respect to the head injury haunts that whole autopsy report. So uh, I, I think we have to deal with this medical evidence within the most stringent limits and not try to, to push the evidence too far. Uh, I'm happy to say only that a study of the medical evidence is consistent with uh, the view that two bullets uh, struck the president from opposite directions, that this evidence in and of itself does not falsify that theory. I had an opportunity to interview Dr. Weck with reference to my documentary, and um, one of the questions I put to him was uh, whether he accepted the existence in the back of the head of a small entrance wound, um, as discovered by uh, doctors Fink and Boswell. And uh, also, uh, he, w with reference to this wound, Dr. Weck said, yes, if you are going to accept the autopsy, you must accept the existence of this small wound a neat wound, a, a wound that had a coning effect, a beveling effect. Um, do you feel, in, on the basis of your uh, research, that this wound uh, is mistakenly placed or that it doesn't exist uh, or that it's incorrectly characterized in the autopsy? Well, quite, quite clearly there's a conflict between the description of the back of the president's head as given by the Parkland surgeons, which indicated that the parietal and occipital bones were sprung open and, and blown open uh, to such an extent and to such a low point that cerebellar tissue was proceeding, was protruding. Certainly there's an obvious conflict between this description of the back of the president's head and the description given by the uh, Bethesda surgeons, who indicated that there was this small entrance hole 2.5 centimeters uh, uh, to the right and slightly above the external occipital protuberance. In other words, almost dead center and a little bit to the right uh, of this occipital bone. Uh, there is a conflict here. It, it seems to me that uh, uh, <laughs> at one's most extreme hazard does one move to the position of saying that any government uh, investigator uh, lied about evidence lied about what the evidence was uh, or fiddled the evidence. Uh, for example, I think one of the strongest indications of the impact of a bullet from behind, and incidentally, it seems to me there is much more evidence uh, of the impact of a bullet from the front on the president's head uh, than there is of one from behind. But I think one of the strongest pieces of evidence is the existence of these two fragments, ballistically matched Oswald's rifle found, found in the front seat of the limousine. 
um, because I can't account for how they got into the limousine except through uh, an impact on the president's head. Now, for the critic, and critics have suggested this, that these fragments were uh, were planted by governmental agents since the uh, car was in government hands after the assassination. This throws, to, to, to suggest this sort of thing, throws the whole investigation into paralysis, it seems to me. Because at that point, it becomes impossible to disjoin the good evidence, the clean evidence, from the dirty evidence. In other words, one has then no longer any criteria for distinguishing between evidence one wants to base conclusions on and evidence which one, one wants to throw away as, as false trails. And it seems to me that a, a logical consequence of, of doing that at any point in the study of this whole case is to announce that one has ended one study. Uh, because logically, one can't proceed any farther. So that's uh, the background uh, to why, given um, very problematical circumstances and very problematical evidence surrounding the existence of this small ho hole in the president's head, namely that none of the FBI or Secret Service agents present at the autopsy, nor any of the Parkland doctors who examined the back of the president's head at Parkland Hospital, uh, stated that they saw this hole. Well, is it crucial that the Parkland doctors uh, uh, didn't see it? After all, the president uh, supposedly was not turned over for any kind of detailed examination at Parkland Hospital. No, it's not. It's not critical. It's ancillary, but it is rather unusual that, for for example, uh, Dr. Kemp Clark, the neurosurgeon attending, the only neurosurgeon actually to see the president's head, uh, a skilled surgeon. Uh, would not have detected a bullet entry hole somewhat below the massive defect on the right side of the president's head. This is curious to me. Also curious, and even more curious, is the fact that none of the people present at the autopsy, uh, with the exception of the of the autopsy surgeons who declared the existence of this hole in their in their report, none of these other people uh, saw the hole. So, in spite of the fact that we have this problematical evidence surrounding the existence of this hole. And in spite of the simplification of the whole theory that would uh, eventuate uh, uh, from from uh, neglecting it, it seems to me we have to go along with with it and continue to believe in its existence. You mentioned the bullet fragments earlier that were found in the limousine, and uh, you suggested uh, correctly that a number of the critics have said that uh, these may have been planted fragments, and uh, Mr. Marcus in his uh, study, uh, The Bastard Bullet, uh, gives us the possibility that Commission Exhibit 399, the one whole uh, pristine and uh, almost intact bullet, uh, conceivably was was a plant. Uh, I was under the impression, Dr. Thompson, in an article, or rather in a letter to the New York Review of Books in 1966, uh, that you uh, at one time uh, held a similar position and that you have modified your position in uh, your your new book, Six Seconds in Dallas. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. As I say in my book, I earlier had um, adopted what I call the Popkin theory. I uh, had found that uh, Professor Popkin here on the West Coast had introduced this in his study in the New York Review. And uh, at that time, it, it seemed to me that there was very good warrant for believing in in the the plant theory of Commission Exhibit 399. Uh, 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 I still think there is a good warrant for believing in the plant theory for 399. I think there is an alternative theory, uh, which I'm, I'm inclined to accept now, but uh, I accept it with no great enthusiasm. Uh, there are great problems with it. Um, what inclines me to believe that uh, 399 really was involved in the assassination is the joining of two rather atypical circumstances. 399 is a very atypical bullet. In fact, any bullet fired from Oswald's rifle at normal muzzle velocity seemed to get deformed when it hit anything. Uh, even the ballistic comparison rounds appeared to be deformed in a, along a longitudinal axis. This bullet is just slightly squeezed along the tail. I examined it in the archives. The very atypical projectile. And given, too, the descriptions of the president's back wound that comes from uh, the uh, Bethesda autopsy surgeons on the night of the 22nd, which we find in the Siebert O'Neill report, that's a very atypical wound. 
bullets simply do not penetrate uh, only one and a half or so inches into flesh. Uh, this is a very strange and peculiar uh, sort of situation. And yet, uh, as one studies the rest of the evidence surrounding this, uh, I'm, I'm uh, driven to believe that the autopsy doctors were correct, that the, that the wound did only penetrate that far. Now, if that's the case, it seemed to me the simplest thing was to simply join these two very atypical pieces of, of evidence and join them under the hypothesis that 399 was fired from Oswald's rifle, we know that, and was fired from the rifle uh, as it was located on the sixth floor of the depository, uh, but was fired at less than normal muzzle velocity, it was the product rather of a short charge that is a defective cartridge. We know the ammunition is 19 years old and thus is uh, rather un unreliable in 1963 or even more today. Uh, this would match with some rather fragmentary reports we have from the witnesses present in Dealey Plaza, namely that the first shot had a firecracker pop sound. Many Secret Service agents uh, indicated this, indicated that it didn't have the sharp crack of a rifle. Um, uh, now we're we're nearing. I mean, and you've picked, I think, a, a a point in my reconstruction, which is very near the periphery of the case, where I'm more and more unsure of my ground, when I'm much more willing to entertain alternative hypotheses and things of this sort. But uh, it seems to me that by joining all these atypical phenomena together under one hypothesis, uh, one gets a sounder theory. Uh, than by postulating that 399 was not involved in the assassination uh, at all, attempt at all. Then, of course, one has to account for whatever bullet uh, struck the president in the back. One has to find that bullet. It doesn't seem to be available. One has to go on to explain why it didn't penetrate any farther, etc., uh, etc. Et one has difficulties if one uh, rejects this theory and buys the plant theory. But uh, uh, I'm very hesitant at this point in this whole, whole area. Um, Curtis Crawford on my broadcast felt that uh, with reference to the location of the back wound uh, we didn't have a mistake uh, we we had either a, a lie or we had the truth uh, do you think that is too strong a, a statement uh, I, I would gather from what you said that that the back wound may have been uh, mistakenly placed uh, mr crawford was not uh, uh, persuaded that it was he felt that uh, uh, commander humes had been rather consistent uh, in uh, the past couple of years with reference to that and was again so on the CBS inquiry and the reason I, I, I was especially anxious to get your opinion on the, on the location of the back wound is that I gather from your book that you've had an opportunity to uh, have conversations with Dr. Boswell and I wondered if, if he had uh, elucidated uh, anything on, on uh, the position or location of the back wound. Well, uh, Dr. Boswell didn't tell me anything that he had not already told other reporters. He claims that he mistakenly placed the back wound on the autopsy face sheet, Commissioning Exhibit, 395, Commissioning Exhibit 397, in a position that was uh, somewhat lower uh, than its actual position. This contention of Dr. Boswell uh, troubled me immensely uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, this back wound is... Uh, the only wound on that face sheet which seems to be mislocated. All the other wounds seems to, seem to have been located in their proper positions, positions which agree with the autopsy face sheet, and, pardon me, with the official autopsy report. In addition, of course, the lower, uh, mistaken now, location of the back wound matches uh, the location of the wound uh, as described by the Secret Service and FBI agents who saw the President's body at Bethesda uh, Naval Hospital, and also matches the location of holes in the, in the President's clothing. Thus, uh, uh, Dr. Boswell's uh, so-called mistaken location of this wound uh, seems to be a rather amazing coincidence that his mistaken location lines up with all these other points. 
Dr. Weck, Dr. Sarah Weck of Pittsburgh, pointed out a most interesting point. Pointed out that uh, Dr. Humes, Dr. Boswell, and other doctors have all agreed uh, that they hazarded the opinion on the night of the 22nd that the bullet had been forced out of the back wound during external cardiac massage. Now, Dr. Weck points out that external cardiac massage is impressed on the breastbone in front, a bone which would be approximately directly opposite the lower location of the back wound, and thus would be a reasonable uh, a grounds for accounting for a bullet being forced out of the back at that location. What he asks, though, is that uh, uh, how Dr. Humes would explain the fact that if the wound is really located in the neck, then how external cardiac massage impressed on the breastbone would in any plausible fashion force out a bullet out of the neck. Yes, indeed. And uh, Dr. Wecht uh, thinks that this is a very critical point. I'm glad to agree with him. I think he's caught something very significant. You make reference in your book, uh, uh, giving Dr. Boswell as your authority, uh, to an additional autopsy descriptive uh, face sheet uh, prepared uh, during the autopsy. Can you tell us anything about that? Yes. Uh, I asked Dr. Boswell how the autopsy surgeons knew when they went around, when they waited around later to write their official report some two days later that the location of the occipital wound in the president's head was 2.5 centimeters to the right and slightly above, etc., since that was not marked on any of the papers available to us. He thought for a moment and then replied, oh, that was marked on the other autopsy face sheet. Well, this was the, uh, uh, the first anyone had heard of another autopsy face sheet similar to the one that's preserved as Commission Exhibit 397. He indicated that that measurement uh, was uh, noted on that face sheet as well as such other information as the color of the president's eyes, things of this sort. Uh, he indicated that as far as he knew, this second autopsy face sheet uh, simply had been lost uh, at some point. I wonder if we could turn to the Zapruder motion picture film, which occupies a large portion of your book. One of the things that was uh, especially uh, instructive to me yesterday at your press conference here in Los Angeles uh, was something that you had characterized in your your book uh, rather well, but which uh, didn't come alive, as it were, for me until I until I heard you express it. And you differed, I thought, from. Uh, someone such as Raymond Marcus, who has uh, spoken uh, on the uh, Zapruder uh, film uh, to our audiences uh, at Pacifica, you characterized the clutching uh, motion, or what had been previously described as the uh, clutching uh, movement of the president's hands as seen in the Zapruder film uh, after the uh, car emerges from uh, behind the limousine, uh, that is from Abraham Zapruder's point of view, uh, you did not characterize this as a clutching uh, motion. I think many people heretofore have been persuaded that the president at that point had already sustained a wound in his throat and in some sort of uh, protective reaction was attempting to reach for his throat where he'd already been wounded. Am, am I correct in, in, in thinking then that uh, the president, in, in your opinion, has not uh, sustained a wound uh, in the front of his throat at that point, uh, but is giving us, uh, is displaying a, a rather different reaction. Yes, my uh, curiosity was excited by a conversation with Marilyn Sitzman and William and Gail Newman, two witnesses who uh, were very close to the president at the time he was hit. And they in, in indicated to me that his hand seemed to come up uh, in a uh, spasmodic gesture as if to protect his face, and uh, they were not aware of any clutching movement. So at that point, I went back and studied with great care the Zapruder film at Life. At the time, I was a consultant to Life, and determined that actually, as the president's hands come up, his fists are clenched, that he, that his hands go up beyond neck level. They come up to about nose level and are clutched in a violent sort of spasmodic movement. But as one studies this movement, it becomes apparent rather quickly that it's not a clutching movement at the throat. He's not reaching for no, his throat. No, that it's a rather hunching movement of the shoulders and the and the elbows splayed upward with the fists clenched. Yes, I see. And um, personally, I, I, I don't know as to whether this sort of spasmodic movement would be more consistent with a transiting shot through the neck or with a shot which uh, simply struck in the back and, and lodged there. I 
I think on points of this sort, we have no science. Uh, but I don't think it's any evidence whatsoever uh, for a trans for the existence of a transiting shot. I mean, it's not a contraindication to the fact that the shot uh, lodged in the back. But you had already concluded that the wound in the front of the president's throat was indeed uh, uh, caused not by a, a bullet transiting from back to front, but was rather caused by a, a bullet fragment or a bone fragment uh, resulting from the fatal headshot. Is yes, that correct? Yes, other evidence, uh, uh, the examination of the president's shirt and tie, uh, a host of, uh, of um, medical notes from Parkland Hospital indicated to me a vertical channel of laceration up and down the president's neck. Uh, this combined with a small laceration in the midbrain and the left cerebral peduncle uh, indicated to me the possibility that uh, this explosive impact on the president's head might have sent uh, uh, force and fragments downward uh, there to uh, bruise the larynx, uh, nick the trachea on the right anterior side, interestingly enough, and then uh, exit through a small three to five millimeter hole before ca causing a vertical rip in the in the shirt. Uh, this seemed to me to be a more adequate hypothesis to account for this curious and curiously small uh, hole in the front of the president's throat. Uh, haven't you been subjected to rather scathing uh, criticism uh, then for the uh, positing of uh, of a what the press describes? Uh, as a conscience-stricken souvenir hunter, as the agent to transfer uh, the bullet which has fallen out of the president's back uh, to be transferred uh, onto uh, a stretcher that uh, uh, might possibly, or, or, or perhaps you don't agree with this, might possibly have, have held Governor Conley? Uh, well, I think <laughs> one goes to the facts and then one tries to to explain the facts. The fact seems to me that the stretcher on which the bullet was found most likely did not belong to Governor Connolly, that it was a stretcher completely unconnected with the case and may have been the stretcher used in the treatment of a two-and-a-half-year-old Negro child who had been injured about the same time. Um, it's uh, very difficult to account for how a bullet ballistically matched to Oswald's rifle uh, would manage to find its way to a stretcher unconnected with the case. And the hypothesis which I entertain in the uh, in the most gentle terms uh, is that uh, someone may have picked this bullet up out of the president's clothing, where it uh, lodged after uh, having been forced out of his back, or in the floor of trauma room one. Uh, I've been picked up, uh, perhaps as a souvenir. We know that the governor's undershirt, for example, disappeared for over a year uh, due to a souvenir hunter. And uh, I hypothesize that this uh, souvenir hunter may have quickly realized the enormity of his find, uh, the, uh, the personal jeopardy that he was in, and quickly secreted it on this stretcher. The stretcher was along the path of people, of the some 20 people who were in trauma room one with the president, on their way as they left that to go into the elevator to go down to leave the area and to have coffee. Um, I think this is a not a tremendously probable hypothesis, uh, but in some of these areas, um, it's almost the case that we have no plausible yes. hypotheses, and uh, I think this is one of them. I wonder if, if you would uh, give us your thinking on uh, the theory of an early hit, that is, uh, the possibility as uh, suggested by the CBS News Inquiry in 1967 uh, that the president uh, may have sustained uh, a hit much earlier uh, than you or the commission concluded, or rather I should say somewhat earlier than you or the commission concluded he was indeed hit. <coughs> uh, and uh, this theory has been alternately suggested by certain of the critics. Uh, it has the virtue from uh, the standpoint of those who are defending uh, the lone assassin hypothesis of uh, giving uh, sufficient time in, in some instances between uh, the shot that hit the president uh, demonstrably and uh, a second shot that uh, presumably uh, hits uh, Governor Connolly for the first time. Well, this is a very complicated point. One has to discriminate between the hypothesis that has the first shot fired early and hits the president and the first shot fired early which misses the president. Um, the CBS documentary based its conclusion 
upon the so-called jiggle theory of the assassination, that certain jiggles in the Zapruder film could be correlated as startle reactions on Zapruder's part and could be correlated with uh, bullet noises some four to eight, uh, some four to five frames after um, a bullet had been fired, then the, the film would jiggle. Well, CBS found a jiggle at Zapruder Frames 190 and thus uh, concluded that a shot may have been fired at 186. But what CBS did not tell its viewers was that there was a similar jiggle of the same character but of greater magnitude at Zapruder Frame 197, only one-third of a second later and that there was an additional jiggle at uh, Zapruder frame 210, and that at other points in the film there are also jiggles. This theory actually was uh, discussed at Life over a year ago and rejected, I think, with sound warrant. The jiggles are most likely due to imperfections in the, uh, uh, in the machining of the parts in the camera, which permit the film to move uh, forward and away from the lens, thus making certain frames very clear and other frames uh, somewhat uh, unclear. Uh, I don't think, then, that evidence, the jiggle theory... Uh, the the, uh, the so-called jiggles is any evidence of an early hit. Now, I believe Ray Marcus here on the coast has uh, tried to correlate the uh, uh, the first shot with a movement of Mrs. Kennedy's head, uh, a turn on on her part towards her husband uh, shortly after uh, the first shot. Uh, I actually, uh, from my viewing of the Zapruder film, I find Mrs. Kennedy has made that turn by Zapruder frame uh, 183. So that would indicate uh, that if she's turning in reaction to a, to a shot, to the, the, the shot must have been fired way back at the 150 even, or even, uh, or even earlier. Mrs. Kennedy's testimony, of course, on this point is quite uh, ambiguous. Uh, if one reads carefully her testimony, it's not clear whether she's saying that she turned uh, right after the first shot or perhaps just before uh, the president was struck in the head because her language indicates that she recognizes, is, is cognizant of the turn at just about the same time that she uh, sees her husband's head explode. Well, uh, can't one say, perhaps, Dr. Thompson, that, that uh, some of the recollections of the uh, occupants of the limousine uh, are faulty uh, in the, to the extent that the Zapruder film seems to contradict their recollection of the event that it is that their recollection has grown cloudy or confused if that's the case with mrs kennedy if indeed she she did not turn immediately after hearing a shot uh... isn't it also possible that uh, governor conley or mrs conley is is mistaken as to their uh... uh total recall as it were well uh... surely uh... governor conley and mrs conley and all the witnesses in dealey plaza who spoke to the point and felt the governor were the governor was hit by the second shot all these witnesses could be wrong and we would still have the zapruder film and we would have uh... on that film the very remarkable discontinuity that occurs at a zapruder frame two uh... two thirty eight and which raymond marcus here on the on the west coast discovered uh... this sudden drop in the drop in the shoulder the puff in the cheeks the disarrangement of the hair. Mr. Marcus uh, can find even other indices of this, which I have been unable to find in my in my study of the film. Um, and putting all these memories aside, one still has the unambiguous witness of the Zapruder film that after the president was struck, after he is reacting to a bullet hit, some 14 frames, 14 eighteenths of a second after he's been hit, we see the immediate momentum transfer effects of a bullet driving into the governor's back, compressing his chest wall and forcing air up into his cheeks and finally out his mouth. Uh, this seems to be an unambiguous witness and uh, surely the final and complete death of the single bullet theory. Did you conclude uh, that uh, the president's uh, head motion uh, was in no way related to a, a neuromuscular reaction or that, uh, uh, or related perhaps to some kind of a uh, propping up gesture of support by Mrs. Kennedy. Yes, and not only that, but by an acceleration or deceleration of the car. There are various hypotheses that could account for this kind of a movement. For example, I checked the velocity of the car and found it to be constant over these uh, over this time interval in question. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy clearly couldn't have uh, grabbed her husband and, and, and wrenched him over in one eighteenth of a second, and her testimony is that she regretted very much not having grabbed her husband before the impact of the fatal shots. Uh, the neuromuscular question is much more subtle and much more complicated. Uh, here one has to turn, I think, um, most eminently to the acceleration curves of this uh, double violent movement, because they're rather sharp. One finds a sudden acceleration forwards 
and then an equally sharp acceleration, a backwards and even greater acceleration, backwards and to the left, an acceleration which is terminated, which has completed itself uh, in two eighteenths of a second. Now, uh, this seems to be the most unambiguous witness that what we are seeing are two uh, uh, radically uh, opposite impressed forces acting on the head. I mean, the profile of accelerations are the profile that one would get uh, from a double impact, from one billiard ball hitting another, for example. And neuromuscular reflex action would uh, take longer, first of all, and the acceleration curves would be much, uh, much shallower. In other words, it would take longer for the muscles of the neck and shoulder girdle to, to, to stop the head under this gigantic forward acceleration, bring it to a halt, and then reverse its direction. Um, but again, no studies, no possible studies, of course, could have been done on a question of this sort. And I think we're left as we're left in so many aspects of this case with uh, probabilities and improbabilities. In this case, I think it's highly improbable. I wonder if you could tell us in the time remaining uh, about the dent in one of the cartridge cases found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository after the assassination. I thought it was one of the most fascinating points in your book. Well, thank you. This was uh, one of the most gratifying parts of my research. After the main contours of the Reconstruction had to compose themselves, uh, it became apparent to me that uh, there was one conflict, namely that uh, the main contours of the theory indicated that two shots came from the Texas School Book Depository window, whereas three cartridge cases were found up there. So I began looking at uh, the evidence surrounding those cartridge cases and found a rather interesting group of anomalies concerning one of the cases. Um, one of these cases had a dented tip, a dented tip uh, to such a degree that in its present state it could not hold a projectile or a fired a projectile on, on November 22nd. Um, I investigated various possibilities as to how this tip could have been dented after firing. Could it have been stepped on? Uh, well, the tip uh, the dent itself was of such a narrowness, only about one-sixteenth, one-eighth of an inch, that it seemed to have been incurred by some metal, sharp metal object, rather than the uh, soft, rather flat surface of a shoe. I asked Luke Mooney, who found the, uh, the cartridge cases, whether he had stepped on them or anyone else had stepped on them, and he was offended as could be and said, no, of course, sir, I took all due precautions and did not step on these and made sure they were not stepped on. Uh, could it have been dented in being ejected from the rifle and having hit the wall? Well, I threw some cartridges uh, against a, a similar brick wall, and these cartridges are of, of rather solid brass and do not dent uh, in such an impact. Uh, then I began looking more closely at the uh, other marks and lacks of marks which were on, uh, on this particular cartridge case and found um, a number of anomalies, certain things that were on this cartridge case that were not on the other two uh, uh, cases or the live round. The most interesting thing I developed, uh, I discovered actually at the at the National Archives, uh, which I hadn't found any mention of in any of the documents in the archives or um, in the 26 volumes. I discovered it while supervising the uh, the photographing of these exhibits for life. On the live round found in the rifle and on the two cartridge cases on uh, commission exhibits 544 and 45. There were two um, narrow uh, chambering dents along the side of the casing, whereas on this curious dented uh, projectile, there was no such mark. Uh, uh, this seemed odd to me. Uh, if all cartridge cases and the live round had in fact been in Oswald's rifle, so I pursued it and looked at the two uh, cases uh, which had been test fired in Oswald's rifle and found on one of the test cases uh, uh, clearly the, exactly the same dent of the same magnitude. On the other case, a similar dent but of much smaller magnitude. Uh, I then uh, hypothesized that perhaps, uh, that very likely this dent was a uh, anomaly introduced by the chamber of Oswald's rifle, and that thus uh, what I discovered was the likelihood that this particular cartridge, uh, 543, um, may never have been uh, in a, uh, a fired state in the chamber of Oswald's rifle. Well, didn't Mr. Weisberg conclude that uh, some of the uh, ammunition rounds or live rounds uh, uh, discovered on the te uh, Texas School Book Depository, the sixth floor, that they had perhaps been loaded into other weapons other than Oswald's rifle? Am I, is my recollection correct in that? It may be correct. I, I couldn't confirm it. I, don't, yes. uh, I simply don't know of what you speak. 
You uh, worked with uh, a research team uh, of Life magazine. What caused them to uh, abort or discontinue their investigation of the assassination? I don't know. With an organization of that size and magnitude, I don't think any of the Indians know why the chiefs make the decisions they do. Uh, can you tell us, uh, in, in your view now that your, your book is out, you've completed your research, what do you uh, see ahead in terms of the uh, movement for uh, a new investigation of the assassination? What can we expect, perhaps? Well, I hope one critical thing will occur shortly, and uh, as you may know, Life magazine is making an attempt to enjoy distribution of this book. Um, Why I, is that? Uh, they claim that the sketches that we used in this book, uh, sketches which depict uh, the events on the, dip on the Zapruder film, infringe their copyright on the film. Of course, at an earlier point, uh, we made every effort to uh, get permission to use the film itself, which would have been in eminently more uh, 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 helpful than the sketches that we evidently had to use, uh, but were refused, and finally at one point offered to turn the whole book over to life, to turn over all commercial interest in the book to life in exchange for getting these frames into the, pub in, in, into the public domain. We were refused, and at that point went ahead with sketches. When the book came out, I uh, then urged Life, and have been urging them now for some month, uh, to release these critical frames, uh, because they, sh they show things which are simply invisible on the study, uh, on the copy of the film seen, uh, seen by the commission. This is a, a tremendous piece of evidence and should be released so that people can verify whether it exists or not. I say it does. I work for them. But I think uh, all your listeners, and you too, should have a chance to see this. Well, Life replied to my appeal uh, some two weeks ago by bringing suit against Random House, against my publisher, and against me, uh, asking a judge to enjoin distribution and publication of the book and have all copies of the book that were then available impounded and destroyed. And we're, uh, at the present time, fighting that suit. Our attorneys are very confident that in the many years' time that the suit, suit will be won, but it's a very ugly and costly business. Do you plan any further research into the assassination? Are you involved in any new projects uh, in that regard? No, I'm tired. And uh, I've seen this like a football game in many ways, that an individual picks up the ball and runs with it for a, a certain amount of time, and then someone else picks it up. For example, uh, I've worked on the shoulders of uh, many researchers all over the country, uh, and this book stands on the shoulders of their of their work, and I would hope now that new people would appear to stand on our shoulders and to move the thing further. Uh, but uh, I'm rather tired right now. Well, Dr. Towson, you've been running very hard with the uh, the ball, as it were, for almost an hour in our interview now, and I I want to thank you for uh, coming to Pacifica and talking with us. Uh, where do you go from Los Angeles on your travels now? To Chicago and then to Washington and then back to Haverford to teach on the 3rd of January. Well, we've enjoyed talking with you, and, and uh, I hope it won't be the last time, uh, at least on your next visit to, to California. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bill.